Hey everyone, in this video, we're going to talk about landmarks, finally! So something exciting is happening in the world of Root. A lot of people in Europe have already been able to get their hands on their Marauder Kickstarter editions, which means they've opened them up and shared what the final wordings on all of the landmark cards are. As you see, I have the print and plays from back in, I think, April, and a lot of the text has changed and I've glamorously scratched over it with ballpoint pen. But the final cards are, of course, going to have some slightly different wordings. I'm just showing with what I have right now. I've also 3D printed all of the landmarks, so your editions won't look exactly like this, but what I have is perfectly suitable for teaching the system, and that's what we're going to do today. So we're going to cover the entirety of the landmark system. Now what are landmarks? If you've already played the Underworld expansion, you're probably already familiar with the concept. Uh, we had the lake map in the Underworld and the mountain map, and each one had a little special piece that was associated with it. We had the ferry for the lake map that allowed you to move around the lake, and we had the tower, which granted you a victory point if you ruled the pass at the end of evening. However, with this landmark pack that will actually not be included with Marauder, it will be its own like mini expansion, a little retail packet that will be available. They actually included all of these cards that explain how to use the new landmarks, as well as two cards that allow you to have both the tower and the ferry on any other map. So now with this pack, you'll be able to have rules for setting up the ferry on the winter map so you can move around this great raging river as well as maybe putting the pass in this clearing down here. So the landmarks are different ways that you can augment the map and have one clearing be significantly different than all of the others. And I think that that's a really cool concept and I'm excited to talk about them all individually. So we're going to cover setting up all of the landmarks as well as all the different edge cases that can arise, particularly with the Lost City which is a very interesting landmark, and I'm gonna talk a lot about that towards the end of this video. So stick around particularly for that, because I think there's gonna be some weird situations. So first, let's talk about the setup. If you remember in my advanced setup video, link will be up here in the corner, there was a phase where we talk about setting up the landmarks. So the first thing you do is you, as a group, or maybe give it to the first seat player, choose the map. We choose the winter map, and then you set up the map as necessary with the clearing markers. Then you're going to choose the deck, which of course I always like to choose the Exiles and Partisans deck. Then we seat the players, so you'll have Albert will be player one, Betty will be player two, Kathleen player three, and David player four. And then before you deal out any hand cards, before we think about hirelings at all, we're going to talk about if we want to have landmarks in this game. And of course, we're going to say, yeah, we're going to do landmarks. Then we just decide if we're going to use one or two landmarks. Feel free to use as many as you like, but that's what the rules say is one or two. So let's say we wanted to set up two landmarks. You would take all of the landmark cards and decide if there's one that you don't want to play with. Uh, maybe on the winter map, let's say we don't want to play with the tower, so we just remove that one. It's up to you. Then, they're all kind of, there's rules and setup on one side or the other, so it's kind of hard to uh, really shuffle them, but you can close your eyes and then just deal out two. Ba, 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 and then one, two. So we've got right here the Elder Treetop and the Legendary Forge. Then, you would just look at the setup that's written on the backs of both of the cards. The way that it works is the last player will be the one who sets up one of the landmarks of their choice, and then the second from last player will set up the other one. So in a four-player game, of course, that would be seat four. So David would say, hmm, I would like to set up this landmark. Then they would just read the instructions that are on the setup of the card, take the forge that matches, and then they would just put it where it happens to be, or where they would like to put it. So that they'll put it right there, that's fine. And then they just put this card, flip it over, and then follow any other setup instructions. 
and then Kathleen will take the other one and then they will choose the setup based on the instructions. In this case, the elder treetop says that it must go into a corner clearing and it cannot be adjacent to the other landmarks. A lot of uh, the cards say this, that you can't place them adjacent. So we'll just choose not this corner, uh, how about this one? Okay, there you go. And now that's it. The landmarks are set up. We put all the other ones aside and then you just continue on with the setup. For example, hirelings, and then you deal out the hand cards and then set up with the factions and all of that. Let's talk about the setup of the individual landmark cards. So we've already seen the elder treetop. So let's talk about this one. What it says at the top is that it's not recommended for two players. So you can throw it aside if you're playing a two player game, but any other player count, it's fine. And what it does is, well first, you set it up in a corner clearing, like I said, not adjacent to or with another landmark. So they would have to be at least two away, like that. The effect of the elder treetop is kind of what it looks like. It's providing all the players an extra building slot in that clearing. However, if an enemy is able to remove the building from that building slot, they would get an additional point. So if they would get the normal point from removing a building, that's standard, and then they would get an extra point if they were able to remove it from the uh, elder treetop. So uh, I'm not sure how interesting or how much this is gonna really change gameplay. The Marquise de Cap might find it very interesting, but overall this is probably the most vanilla of the landmarks, but see how it goes for you. Okay. Next one is pretty interesting. This one is the black market. As you can see, my uh, artistic skills aren't exactly uh, that great, but nonetheless, it's a very interesting landmark. So the setup of the black market is you would place the black market in a clearing with only one building slot, not talking about ruins at all. So even though this has one building slot open right now, there's still a ruin, you cannot choose this one. It would only be able to be placed in a clearing with exactly one building slot. This one, uh, this one, this one, and this one. So any of these four would be suitable. And the way that it would work is once you set it up, you draw three cards from the deck. One, two, three. And you would place them without looking at them face down next to the black market card. All right? Then flip over the card and you've completed setup. And then once per turn, if a player has a faction piece in the clearing, meaning one of their own warriors, tokens, or uh, buildings, not including hirelings, not including if you hire riverfolk mercenaries or something, you have to have your own faction piece. But if you have a faction piece in the clearing with the black market, then once per turn, you can swap one of your hand cards with one of the cards that's in the um, black market. Now, note that it's not exactly like swap meet where you can look at a card and say, ooh, I don't like that, I'll put it back. No, 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 you're swapping a card. So it's a little bit of a gamble. So I could say, I'm throwing this one into the black market, we'll put it here. So you declare it and then you just swap it. And then, oh, I'm not really happy with what I got, but that is what it is. Keep, uh, keep in mind that the secret information you have is now you know exactly which card is in the black market in this middle position. And if someone else thinks maybe you hit a good card in there for later, they don't know. Maybe it's a garbage card you got rid of or a really good card you're saving for an end game situation. Keep in mind that it does not say once per turn in daylight or once before you draw. There's no restriction on timing. It just says once per turn. So you could actually draw your cards at the very end of evening and then before you pass your turn, you could take a look at what you got and then decide if you wanted to use the black market. So very interesting, very cool, and I'm curious to see what players end up doing with it. It's the black market, okay? Next up is the Legendary Forge. Now this card is the most different from what we saw in the print and play, so I've had to scratch out a few things, but the way you set it up is you would place the Legendary Forge in a clearing. As long as it's not adjacent to or in the same clearing as a landmark, it's fine. 
So there's no restrictions. I could set it up here or here or here. Doesn't matter. There's no special restrictions. But then what you do is you take the card and depending on the suit of the clearing where you placed it, you take all of the items that correspond to that suit. And that's specifically looking at crafting. So if you're familiar with the crafting of each item, you can see that the fox items are the swords, the hammer, and the crossbow. Had I put it in a mouse clearing, it would be bags and tea, and for rabbits, it would be boots and coins. So I've placed it in a fox clearing, so then I just take all the items that are crafted using fox crafting pieces, and I put them over top of the card, and then I flip the card over like this, okay? So it kind of occupies one third of the supply. If you want, you can put it up next to the supply so it's easy to see what has and has not yet been crafted. And now the way crafting works is in order to craft any of these items, you must have at least one of your faction pieces in the clearing with the legendary forge. So it could be a warrior, a token, or a building. Not a hireling, not a hired mercenary, you get it, a faction piece. If you have a faction piece in the clearing, then you can craft these items. So it doesn't work if you have, let's say, um, a workshop in here, but nothing in this clearing. It's fine. So a workshop or even a sympathy token. Let's use this as an example. If I have a sympathy token right here, I could not craft anything of these cards because the Woodland Alliance does not have a faction piece in the forge. But if they had a warrior, then they could. So they would use, of course, this uh, crafting piece. The crafting piece doesn't have to be itself in the forge. You just craft it following normal rules, but you have to have one of your pieces in the forge. It's a little bit tricky, but I think it makes sense. And then what you do is now you say I have the right to craft one of these forge items. So let's say I craft the hammer. Of course, you still have to have the hammer card. All the same crafting rules apply, but now I craft an item. And whenever you craft an item on the legendary forge card, you get an extra victory point. So you would get three points for crafting this hammer. Extra victory point and you immediately draw a card, which is huge. That's a big, big benefit. And it does sort of incentivize everyone to try and have at least one piece have some presence in the legendary forge. Keep in mind, you don't have to have the crafting piece itself in the forge. That was the old way it worked. All you need now is one faction piece, all right? That one's a little bit tricky. Okay, so that's the legendary forge. We'll put that one off to the side as well. Shoop. Just to briefly go over the ferry and the tower before we get on to my favorite, which is the Lost City. The ferry setup is now place the ferry in a clearing along the river, not with or adjacent to another landmark. So again, it can't be adjacent, it can't be on the same spot, but now that it's not restricted to the lake map, I could say I'm putting it right here. And now the ferry works exactly like it does on the lake map. However, you can't go straight to one over there. That's illegal. It would have to be to an adjacent clearing along the river. So I can move here or I could move here. All right, once per turn, you can move with the ferry the same way that you could on the lake map and you would still get to draw one card, All right? The only difference is unlike the lake map, which is completely interconnected, the rivers are a straight path. So I couldn't just go all the way over here. Uh -uh. All right, the ferry. Very familiar. The tower is one that kind of caught me by surprise, but the setup of the tower is now that you can place the tower in a clearing with a ruin, okay? So it has to be like this, this, this. And the only restriction is that it's not in the same clearing as another landmark. So if the ferry is here, I could not place one here. I could, however, place the tower here. So whether it's the ferry or the forge, it's fine. When you place the tower, it does not, it's the only one that doesn't say adjacency, right? You can place the tower adjacent to another landmark. I don't know why that is, but hmm, just something to remember. And the way the tower works is very simple. 
At the end of your evening, if you rule the clearing with the tower, you score a victory point. So it's a very king of the hill mechanism where you're fighting for rule with the fo That's a gecko. So unlike the uh, forge and the black market where you get some value just by having a faction piece, no, no need to rule, the tower actually incentivizes you to rule the clearing and to push everyone else out, okay? So I like that in theory, but I am glad that we don't have to have it on the mountain map every time now because the mountain map already has the covered paths and with the covered paths and the tower, it just led to a, a few too many points being thrown around that accelerated the game a little too much. So I'm glad that we can now mix and match. I can choose not to have the tower on the mountain map. And that is it for all of the landmarks, with the exception of the Lost City. This is the reason you're buying the pack a lot of the time, because it is the coolest of all the landmarks. So let's talk about the setup first. Place the Lost City in a clearing with the river. Again, not with or adjacent to any other landmarks. They can't overlap, but it can go on any river clearing. So here would be fine, here, here, or here. All that is good. So we'll pop that right there. And you can guess from the art what it does. And that's that. The clearing with the lost city counts as fox, rabbit, and mouse at all times for all purposes. That's right. This basically becomes a wild clearing where you can do any sort of action with all the suits. Of course, it would kind of cover up what's already there. So two out of the uh, three suits, in this case, the fox and the rabbits, would have five clearings where they're applicable. So we have one, two, three, four, five rabbit clearings, five fox clearings, and because the, whoop, <laughs> because the mouse was covered up, in this case, we still only have the four mouse clearings, but the implications of this are so huge. Let's go over just some of the different um, utilities of the Lost City with each of the factions. Let's take a look at all of the different ways that the factions can think about and make really cool use of the Lost City. Keep in mind that I've painted my version of the Lost City to have the fox be red, the rabbit be yellow, and the mouse be orange. The actual version is going to look more like this, where all the suits are just going to be painted gold. And I just found that this was a little bit easier to read. Feel free to do it the way that I did. But for the Marquise de Cat, obviously, a workshop is a wild crafting piece. So this has tremendous value for a low crafting faction like the cats. So keep in mind that you can still only activate a single crafting piece once per turn. It's just that each time that you choose to activate it, it could be feasibly any one of these suits. So in one turn you can say, I'd like to craft a hammer, and then in the next turn I'd like to craft charm offensive. And you can use the same one, but just each individual turn, okay? A sawmill in the Lost City is also really cool because now you can spend any card of any suit to do the overwork action. And of course, if ever the cats lose warriors from the Lost City, they could spend any card uh, that they have in order to do the field hospitals action. Which means if they have the keep in the Lost City, it's virtually impenetrable because they could spend any card from their hand and then just respawn those cats right back at their keep. Very nice. The Eerie Dynasties is a similar interaction where their roosts are crafting pieces, so a roost in the Lost City would be hugely beneficial, but not just for crafting, for their entire decree. So the decree is completely suit locked, so any action like a recruit or a move or a battle or even a build can all be done with any suited card in the decree. So if you can keep a roost in the Lost City, you have immense flexibility. Almost like having a bird card in the decree, but now you have a whole clearing where any action could be your fallback. Okay, very nice. So similar interactions with those wild crafting pieces. A Corvid plot is a wild crafting piece. Get out of here. Um, if you have a sympathy token, it's also a wild crafting piece. But this is a very strange interaction, okay? This is one that I'm a little, it's a little controversial. But basically, when you revolt using uh, a sympathy token in the Lost City, you can revolt with any combination 
of cards. That's because technically all cards match the Lost City. And it doesn't say that it has to match the base. They just have to match the clearing. So let's say that I wanted to revolt in the Lost City and put down this mouse, or sorry, this rabbit base. I could spend any combination of cards. I can spend a rabbit and a fox. I could spend two mice and basically revolt in the Lost City like that. And then you get the warrior. The issue is now what's crazy, I could then revolt again in the Lost City. So players can put a whole bunch of their stuff in that clearing. And even though there's already a base, I could theoretically revolt again. The only restriction is that I have to have at least a base on the board because revolt can only be done if you have an unbuilt base. Okay, so once all your bases are out, you can stop doing this. But this is one way that you can actually have two bases in the same clearing, which is pretty interesting. Just be careful because no piece is safe in the a Woodland Alliance's base if they have two supporters because they could just revolt and then get another officer, get more warriors there. It's crazy. But keep in mind that the whole thing when you revolt and you get to place warriors uh, equal to the number of sympathetic clearings, those sympathetic clearings much match, uh, must match the base. So what that means is if I'm doing a revolt, no matter which cards I spend, if I'm placing the rabbit base, then I would get warriors equal to the number of rabbit suited clearings. So it's not, um, it's not all the suits. I wouldn't get, you know, five warriors in this clearing because of having five tokens around. No, no, no. Just sympathy, sympathetic clearings that match the suit of the base being placed. Okay? Strange interaction with the lizard cult is that now they can actually always do their conspiracies in the Lost City because the Lost City will always match the outcast suit. However, that means that sometimes if you do a sanctify action or even a build action, you can get a mouse garden in this clearing and a fox garden in the clearing as well, which is amazing. So you can always be very worried about being targeted for sanctify or convert or something in the Lost City. But what does this mean for crafting? Well, don't worry about it. They've drastically simplified it. You can still only craft cards that match the printed suit. Okay, so it's not that complicated. If the outcast is mouse, that means only mouse gardens can be activated, not this uh, fox garden because it happens to be in a mouse clearing. Okay, so that dream of crafting tax collectors is still dead as the lizard cult. You cannot craft tax collectors or soup kitchens. Wah, wah. Impossible as the lizards. Okay, ah. as the river folk company. Um, there's not that much interaction because they, the only interaction they had with suits is basically placing down a suited trade post. The, the advantage of the Lost City is that they could place any suited trade post as long as there isn't already one. So if I wanted, I could plant a trade post and I could decide if I wanted it to be a fox trade post or a rabbit trade post. It all depends on what my crafting plans are, but nothing too crazy going on there. With the underground duchy, any duchy piece, whether it's a duchy warrior building or a tunnel token, will count to, as a wild piece for the purposes of sway. So it's very valuable to have just one warrior in the lost city at the very minimum, because then it makes your sway options really, really open. So if you see a duchy piece in the lost city, maybe think about battling it, because they could easily get lords with very little effort. Something that the Vagabond loves about the Lost City is that they could use their hammers to craft anything they want. So from the Lost City, if they have two hammers, they could go ahead and craft a boot, and then they can craft a root tea in the same clearing because their hammers are technically wild. And yes, that does mean if they have three hammers, like the Tinker or the Adventurer, they can actually craft something like soup kitchens or tax collectors because one of their hammers could represent a rabbit, the other one a fox, and the other one a mouse. Unfortunately, none of these cards, either of these cards is actually useful for the Vagabond, but you could do it, I guess. So that's one interaction the Vagabond has is wild crafting in addition to wild questing. 
So if you have a rabbit quest and a fox quest, you can do them both in the Lost City, which is super, super helpful for vagabonds that do lean a little bit more on questing. Very cool. When it comes to the Lord of the Hundreds, of course, a stronghold is a crafting piece. So like all the other factions that have crafting pieces, if one exists in the Lost City, it can be wild. But also beware that the Lost City is always going to be applicable during that step in Raze where you would roll the mob die and decide if you were going to place a mob. So if there's no mob in the Lost City, there is likely to be one very soon because as long as you have an adjacent or a clearing that's adjacent with a mob token, there's always the potential for it to spread to the Lost City. Okay. And the last interaction is a little bit of a strange one, and it involves the recover action for the Keepers in Iron. So if you go into the Lost City, where you have a way station and a relic of value 3 or something like that, your recover options are extremely open, because the text on recover says, take any number of relics of the same type as way stations there, and you'd only discard the card used to take the action if you rule fewer matching clearings matching clearings than a relic's value. So it's actually even more clear in the law of root. So here's something that you could do. Let's say that I have a fox card and I want to take the recover action in the lost city. Of course I could because fox matches the lost city, so I recover it. However, do I lose this card? Well, it's actually super easy to not uh, lose the cards because technically it's not about matching the suit of the card I took, but matching the clearings. So if I'm the keepers in iron and I rule a mouse clearing and two rabbit clearings or something like that, I technically rule three clearings that match the suit of recovery or the suits in this case of recovery. So I wouldn't lose the card that I used to take the recover action. It's crazy. So please, please, please be very careful about the keepers in iron if they can get a way station down in the lost city. And of course, that's also a wild crafting piece and a suit where they could theoretically recover with any cards that they have in hand. So be extra careful if the keepers in iron take control of the lost city. Another crazy interaction with the lost city is when it comes to ambush cards. Normally, you only have to think of three ambush cards regarding a given clearing. So if I'm doing battle and mouse, as long as I have mouse and I can account for the two bird ambushes, okay, I can guarantee I won't get ambushed here. But because the Lost City matches all clearings, if I do a battle in the Lost City, someone plays the rabbit ambush on me, uh-oh, well, I can counter it with the mouse ambush. So all five of the ambush cards are potentially in play in the Lost City. So even though it's very powerful to hold, keep in mind that it's also very threatening for so many different reasons. Another crazy one is Propaganda Bureau. This one's pretty simple, but it's effective. Any card you have could be spent to remove a warrior in the Lost City and then place one of your own, right? Because the card just has to match the clearing. And of course, the Lost City makes all cards match this clearing. And even crazier still is that all partisan cards are in play in the Lost City. And yes, if you have multiple crafted, you could use all of them. So if in some magical universe I've crafted rabbit, fox, and mouse, and I want to do an attack here, I could say, all right, cool, I'm doing the attack, we resolve the battle, and I'm going to use rabbit partisans, I throw away all my cards besides rabbit. Now I'm going to use fox partisans in addition, and of course all I have are rabbit cards, so I throw those away as well. And, well, what do I have to lose? I've already got my whole hand gone. I'm going to use Mouse Partisans. So you could do an additional three hits if you have all of the Partisan cards in just this one clearing. So be careful about Partisan cards activating as well in the Lost City. Very, very cool. Very dynamic. And that's really all that I have to talk about with the landmarks today. They're very quick and easy to incorporate into a game, but they can change up the geography and all these different edge cases in such interesting ways that I really hope you give them a shot, especially the Lost City. I think this is one of the coolest additions to Root in recent years. And I just want to say thank you guys so much. I've been getting a lot of really good feedback on these videos. 
If you've noticed, I've actually been posting a lot of YouTube shorts lately about uh, little quick strategy tips or uh, clearing up some rules misconceptions in little short format videos. If you like those, let me know and please subscribe as well because I'm going to try and post them on a semi-regular basis with these long form videos coming a little bit more occasionally. So thank you so much. I hope to catch you guys next time.